And in the interest of time, I think uh, I'll just ask the panelists to come up. Um, Corin Hardin, who is the um, founder of Makani Power. Um, Stephen Kieran, who is the founder of Kimber, Kieran Timberlake Architecture Firm and the 2010 winner of the ND National Design Awards Architecture Award. And Lisa Strasfeld, partner of Pentagram and the 2000 recipient of the National Design Awards Interactive Design. So we'll jump right in, and I understand uh, at some point we'll be receiving questions from the audience or from the world at large. Um, and I'll start with Stephen. First of all, congratulations on uh, your wonderful award, winning the competition for the new American Embassy in South uh, London, which is a huge honor, and uh, I'm sure a lot of challenges. Uh, and it's going to be a significant building in a number of ways. But perhaps least discussed is it as a pioneer in energy conscious design. An architectural review of your building suggests it will be a net exporter of energy. In other words, it produces more energy than it consumes. Could you please give us a brief picture of what technologies will enable it to perform so well? Yeah, there are several strategies. First, uh, cutting down the demand loads on the building is step one to lower the energy use and energy profile of the building. Um, there are a number of strategies that we've used to do that, but once we've done that, um, we then sought a series of strategies to generate energy and wherever possible sought combinations between tactics that would both um, shed energy from the building and generate it at the same time. And one example of that would be the what we call the scrim that wraps the building. It's a cubic building with um, a scrim composed of uh, ETFE, a polymer film. And on that, there are a variety of um, mechanisms to both shed energy on the one hand in the form of solar films that create shading um, on the building uh, and, and shield it from, um, from thermal gain. And at the same time, uh, there are photovoltaics on those surfaces that gather energy from the sun um, to use it to power the building. So that's an example of a kind of combined integrated strategy that simultaneously um, keeps load from the building and generates electricity to power the building. Um, you know, beyond that, there are literally dozens of strategies, um, including using a pond on the site as a um, as a heat sink for the building, um, including using renewable fuels to generate um, power for the building, and not just for the building, but for the district within which it sits. It's so really a composite of dozens of strategies uh, along both fronts, shedding energy and generating energy. For, for people who have not seen the building, it's completely clad in glass, which I remember when it uh, first came out in the newspapers, um, I was just so shocked because it was not what one would expect of, a, of an embassy. It was not, it didn't look shored up, it didn't look fortified. And it, it made me think about something that I've often wondered about some of our civic buildings uh, and, all, and the new technology. Can a building perform environmentally and at the same time have some of the symbolic attributes that major public buildings have? Uh, we had both goals, certainly, going into the competition. Um, uh, you know, we selected the form based on combinations of performance requirements on the one hand and the art of civic design on the other. So we sought a form that really um, had permanence and solidity to it. Um, we selected the form of the building in a way rather than designed it. The cube is been around longer than, or as long as man has been on Earth. Um, it's an ancient form, and we selected it um, rather than designed it. It was also an optimal form in terms of performance, in terms of relationship of surface to mass um, or to volume uh, within the interior. So, you know, we sought throughout ways to do both, to, to convey uh, 
you know, some of the significance of that structure as a government building, um, about the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom, um, certainly a very, very long-lasting relationship and one that uh, most would view as one of real permanence. And we sought that in the building uh, at the same time that we sought to um, create the building not as a fortification, but as a beacon. Um, you know, one of the first thoughts we had was to completely subvert everything we were told we had to do about the building, which um, today is unfortunately um, all about fortification in many ways. So um, we sought to basically turn it inside out and turn what one would expect to be a solid masonry perimeter of a building um, into the exact opposite of that, a glass cube. And um, fortunately for us today, the technologies exist to do that and to satisfy both requirements simultaneously. But we really imaged it as a beacon of the relationship, um, uh, you know, of a transparent relationship as opposed to a fortified one. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, one that would have solidity and strength uh, and not be a stylistic form that would feel outdated, uh, you know, but one that would have some real permanence to it all the while uh, you know, de designing with performance in mind. Great. Congratulations. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have for, uh, is for Corwin. And Corwin has a wonderful um, wing in, in the triennial at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, it's always on my highlight tour. Uh, it's a juicy red wing suspended uh, from the ceiling of one of the galleries. And um, it's designed to harness the enormous power of high altitude wind and then it's connected uh, by a cable to, to the ground and connected to a power grid. Do you want to say a few words about it, um, Corwin, to this new wind power technology? Uh, I'm sure I can say a couple hours worth of words, but... Uh, uh, sure. <laughs> it is, uh, yeah, there is a tremendous amount of energy up in the, uh, up in the uh, higher altitudes um, above where conventional wind can reach at the moment, and there's a lot of benefits to uh, getting away from uh, conventional wind energy, which before I say anything bad about it, is quite a great technology and is the cheapest form of renewable energy that we have today. Um, at the same time, it's very materials intensive. Uh, you know, having a tower, having three blades is, is a lot. And uh, what we do is we take the most effective part of wind turbine, um, that would be the tips of the blades, and we make that into a, a flying wing. And that's, that's what you see. And, uh, um, and that uh, is a much more effective way of harnessing the wind in terms of materials, in terms of cost, um, and effectiveness. Do you think that someday it will render the, the land turbines, wind turbines that we see, do you think we'll, it will render them obsolete? Uh, people do like to ask that question. It is, um, it's a lot to aspire to. I think that if it does work, I'm quite confident that it is a much better solution and that it's much more I think particularly it offers a lower cost of electricity, but it is also much more scalable because it is so much lighter. Um, at the same time, it, uh, it is important to give ample respect for the amount of work that's gone into the mm -hmm. conventional technologies and how good they really are. And one more question is, what are the, what are the main obstacles at this point? Uh, well, there's always the obstacle of funding, which I hate to mention, but it is a real obstacle. The other obstacles are um, scaling this technology up and making it reliable. I'd say that at this point, the, uh, the team at Makani and several other teams around the world have shown that this is a really quite a feasible technology and something that does have, a, we've already demonstrated that the performance is there. It remains to be seen whether or not we can actually make it at a utility scale mm -hmm. and make it last for years at a time. And I have to ask one more question, which a question I get from the pub public all the time is, will, it, will, will these interfere with, with flight patterns of aircraft and birds? Um, yeah, so we, we actually fly um, lower than commercial aircraft and uh, higher than most birds. Um, so certainly much higher than birds of prey and the big uh, raptors and so forth that you see um, that there's a lot of concern about in conventional wind farms. Um, and so I'd say in many ways we uh, avoid both of those, which is good. Great. Lisa, who is one of the pioneers in data management um, and hopefully will help us citizens understand and be
be able to grapple with a lot of this information um, and data that we're collecting that Ed Schlossberg was just uh, talking about. Some have advocated a future in which people's behavior is changed through increasing the amount of intelligence in the machines that they use. A current TV ad shows a kitchen in which virtually every device provides inf performance information, temperature estimates, news, and so on. In the current triennial exhibition, there are several such design projects. The average American house is now 45% larger than it was 30 years ago. So I suppose there's enough room for added information. But how far do you think design information and I suppose design politics and education can go in improving the quality of daily life? Good question. <laughs> Uh, so first, it's, what's key um, for this kind of work is uh, data, which um, I'm fascinated by um, Stephen's projects, uh, collecting data from homes um, and new sources of energy. And by the way, I have no, before I answer the question, I have no expertise in energy, except that I am a consumer, and uh, I guess because I live in this country, a, a significant consumer of energy. Um, we, uh, th there's so much data available, which is why um, there are all these opportunities now to make sense of it. So the hardest part of the challenge is, is already kind of underway, which is it just um, collecting data. Uh, and then we have opportunities. We did a project with GE for the eco-imagination effort um, to attempt to visualize consumption of energy of, of home appliances. Um, so I'll use this as a way of answering that question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the biggest challenge is making it accessible and engaging. And actually, by the way, what Richard said about design, uh, what he said, I mean, I, I really do, um, I never put it that way before, but I really sell my ignorance. Um, in this case, uh, I'm especially motivated to do um, kind of consumer-based projects where um, there's some there's something that I feel like I should be engaged and interested in, but that's really tedious and boring, and I can't even, uh, and my eyes sort of glaze over when I look at it. So that's what, what happened when we started working on this project, um, looking at consumption of home. In this case, it was just home appliances. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to visualize the data, which wasn't really, which, which was out there. We worked with um, GE, our client. Um, the data was out there, but it wasn't really that engaging or interesting. It wasn't that interesting to know that central air conditioning consumes a lot more energy than, um, than a hair dryer, um, or that um, some parts of the country consume more, ener um, more energy than others. And, um, so, but we did find is that the units, the units for energy consumption are completely opaque. We don't get it. Like, well, certainly a watt doesn't really mean anything, and it's not measured that way, but a kilowatt hour, which was an attempt to um, kind of make energy consumption accessible, and it's how it, we're billed um, for energy in our homes. Um, even a kilowatt hour, we don't understand. We understand what 72 degrees, we understand degrees, we, we understand under other units, um, like gallons of gas. We have guilt about um, gas consumption but we don't really have a sense of guilt about kilowatt hour consumption. So this, this project that we did um, with GE was really about um, uh, enforcing that guilt <laughs> or, or um, engaging us. When I say engage, um, the goal is to get people either pissed off, to, get, to shock people, to, again, or, yeah, or, or instill some kind of guilt. So we, um, we, we converted, uh, home appliance energy consumption um, to units that we understand, to dollars, which we do understand, um, and, and that will tell us something, to gallons of gas, and then we, um, I have an amazing team, um, we uh, converted, I have to credit Hilla Katke for this, but um, we converted uh, um, energy consumption into what we called appliance specific units, so it was what a kilowatt hour would mean for certain appliances. So um, for, um, I can't even remember, for a toaster it might mean 36 pieces of toast, um, or for a washer it would mean 
um, you know, two cycles of wash. Or um, again, shockingly, for central air conditioning, air, central air conditioning, it means about 12 minutes of um, cool air. Wow. So that, that's just one example. Uh, and um, one, one last thing, Ellen um, Lepton brought up this challenge of data visualization being either on, on the one hand um, accessible and engaging, on the other um, really opaque. I think that is the challenge, that um, a lot of data visualization um, requires, I'm thinking about um, all these amazing visualizations of the stimulus package, for example. Um, they require that you really kind of lean forward, take a sip of some caffeinated beverage. You, you really have to engage, and it takes a lot of work to get into. I'm, and and th those visualizations are all really important because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information packed into typically one picture. Um, but I'm really interested in uh, getting us all engaged in things that we should care about um, without requiring that much work. So that's that's the the problem I would like to help solve for many issues, including energy consumption. Do you think it requires um, a lot of behavior change, which is often very difficult to achieve? Uh, in a way, the, the hard part is to understand what to do. I think that, um, uh, yeah. I, I agree completely that the, the first act has to be comprehension of what's happening to you and about you. Um, you can't act intelligently and intervene as a designer without uh, really actionable knowledge. And that does require clarity of visualization, and we're very, very short on that. You know, one example, one rather kind of stunning one in the field I um, traffic in is where energy actually is used. And the focus that we all typically have on it is, as you described, through um, uh, you know, basically things we use around us, the lights that are on in the room, um, the monitors that are plugged in. That's most of our thoughts about where energy goes. Um, and it's not well visualized, I, I agree. It's not understood and imaged for us in a way that we can understand it and interact with it um, through that kind of currency of cost of, of energy, of environmental cost, of carbon cost. Uh, a, a quick example would be, for instance, that uh, we're very, very focused in my world on uh, the energy use in buildings, on both the process loads in them and the inherent or integrated um, energy use of a building. However, before the building actually even serves um, those it is designed for, for one minute, um, you've already developed a product that has cost huge amounts of energy. Um, a little house we did, for instance, um, uh, before it opened, 40% of the energy it would use over 50 years had already been used up, um, embodied in the materials of the construction. Um, a house we did at the Museum of Modern Art was 50% of it. Uh, that's not a really well-known fact, and it's not easy to image, and it's not easy to understand how to interact <coughs> with it as a designer and start to manipulate the way you assemble something in the first place so that you can recover that energy in the second place. Uh, and it goes on and on virtually about every topic in design. They all begin with comprehension and understanding of problems through data visualization uh, that is based on um, real research. And those are where the biggest and most profound questions and suggestions for how to um, become a better designer, a more ethical designer, really arise. And I'm sure that extends to retrofitting older buildings, which I'm not sure there's really much data for in, 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 in how retrofits will affect energy usage. I mean, that's a much uh, bigger topic, actually, than new buildings. Mm -hmm. um, in any given year, we only add about 1% to 1.5% to the stock of buildings that are already here. So in order to 
affect any really meaningful change, um, a central focus, the central focus, which always seems to go on the new buildings, um, like the embassy and things like that, and not on the 99% of the world already that already exists, is in some ways really misguided if you yeah. really want to make yeah. big change and yeah. make it fast. Focusing on the stock of what you already own is a more provocative and profound yeah. way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, um, I By the way, one, uh, one other observation on what we already own is that as designers, we, we tend to focus on how to make things, how to put them together. Uh, but the biggest and most important thing we can do in the making of buildings as responsible um, you know, ethical managers of uh, the energy that goes into them is to design how they come apart. Um, I watch in Philadelphia buildings being pulverized all the time and the materials are rendered um, marginally useful. Um, they're, quote, um, recycled in some ways but with vast energy involved. So thinking about the opposite of the problem of how to put something together um, and instead turning it around, also thinking and designing for how to take it apart so you don't have to destroy it. Uh, you know, would be a very profound way to recover and reuse that 40% of the energy that you used over 50 years in the context of a whole piece of architecture. Lisa? Well, I had a question, or maybe a kind of question, vision, aspiration for residential energy use. Is there, I'm just curious, Carwin, Corwin, is there, um, could your product, the, this kite, <laughs> um, be used, could we, could Put it? Put that in a residential uh, setting. Yes, and could we be uh, responsible for, well, that, that's sort could of. Could you tether it to a house? No. No, okay. <laughs> Short answer is no. Uh, they're really suited, uh, certainly fundamentally, for utility scale power. Mm -hmm. um, before I go into that, actually, I was going to mention that I think one of the ways that, uh, that is perhaps overlooked a little bit and that um, sort of understanding the embodied energy and material, which I think is very, very important, um, actually, and I think also as a designer, at least in my experience, it's also really neat to see how materials are manufactured at sort of their most base level. And sort of like the first time you do a casting, the first time you make various different things, you, uh, you really become very sensitive to, you know, particularly um, when you're forming things, how much energy goes into that. And then I'd say that the next thing as far as for existing building stock, you know, the one thing I don't see measured that often, and perhaps both of you have had some experience with this, is the, um, the inflow factor in the building as far as how much air is actually leaking out of the building at any one time. And that um, it's perhaps not the most sexy thing to measure in some ways because it's not electrical energy and it's not the thing that is perhaps topical at the moment. But mm -hmm. I'd say inflow factor and the amount that our Certainly in the existing building stock, how much each building leaks is actually, and how that transfer of energy between the envelope of the building and the outside environment is, is actually a really huge loss of energy and an incredible amount of energy transfer with the outside. And how you measure that is also quite tricky as well. Um, so typically one way to measure that is you uh, inflate the house actually and you look at how air gets out of the house um, but it's a very tricky thing to actually quantify and measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my sort of kind of design editorial hat is going, I know that corporations are um, taking more responsibility to um, be more efficient <laughs> consumers of energy. And I think uh, I'm interested for, um, for homes, if there was a kind of uh, sort of guilt index or some way where if you were sort of posting uh, online your energy consumption. You can see the consumption of your neighbor's homes. I mean, th these are the kind of things that, in terms of behavior change, this is the kind of thing that, that um, could really make a difference if you, um, at the same time, you could have some pride that, that your home, I mean, as I think yeah. the case with um, your work now is happening, um, you could have some pride that your home uh, is having a much more minimal impact on the environment, and then you could kind of shame your neighbors into um, <laughs> complying with the same standards. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there are a number of uh, instances now underway of basically developing energy dashboards for buildings. Mm -hmm. um, we've done it with a school in Washington, D.C. Uh, it has an energy dashboard that kids can access on their laptops. 
and observe um, detailed energy use um, throughout the course of the day. There are homes uh, that it is being offered um, for. Um, so it's certainly work that's well underway and um, you know, well begun. Right now, I think the, the, the more difficult part of the equation is the data upon which that information is based. It's very limited. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the number of sensors that are in buildings to sense and understand performance is usually pretty limited, kind of stunningly limited, even though it could be um, expansive. And I think there's a lot of work in that realm of, um, uh, of sensors to understand performance and collection of data that could tune these things a little more finely and provide finer grained profiles of usage than exist now. We're, we're very, very unsophisticated in that regard. Um, a biologist I um, know said that, who studies moths, uh, said that moths have um, something like 7,000 sensors to control movement in their wings. And, uh, in vast buildings today, we probably have no more than a few hundred sensors um, to control you know, a much, much uh, more expansive enterprise than a moth, so. Um. There was, um, can I? Yes. There, um, there was an article in the New York Times over the summer about, um, I don't know, people leaving their air conditioners on um, for extended lengths of time um, because they're, they're not paying for, um, they're, they're not paying their electric bill because of you know, because the landlord is paying the bill, yeah. and there were stories of people who would you know, go on vacation for three or four weeks and, and leave it full blast. Um, when I think of these examples, mm -hmm. I think to myself, well, I mean, the, the current perception is, well, you know, it won't make that much difference, and there are sort of bigger energy issues as well, because you know, we're still using coal and fossil fuel. But, um, but I think that these stories are still important to sell. I loved that story. I love that the Times ran that story on the front page. Uh, I think that um, if we have to get to the point where we, we individually feel like everything we do really does matter. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that this country still, um, yeah. I mean, there is data to show that we consume, you know, like we are so far beyond um, the rest of the world and we're not sort of shamed into making any changes. And I think that if there's a way to kind of take the data um, or to take, take what we know and kind of scale it down to um, um, to, I was going to say, to individuals or to corporations or to um, states and governments and, and um, create a kind of competition um, so that we can, uh, you know, we can have some pride that we're, we're making a difference. But at the moment, there's this sense that none, none of these things really yeah. has an impact. And I think that's a real problem. Yeah, the, the, the other way, by the way, is just charge for every single ounce of it find a way to meter it and charge everybody for every single ounce they use or generate. And they become very attentive real quickly. Um, it's a little yeah. difficult though, because you, I mean, people don't have control of the commons. So it's, you know, as far as, it's very difficult to charge for people's uh, consumption of the atmosphere and consumption of water in some ways, in a, in a broader sense anyway. So that's, right. and I think that's where, uh, particularly with energy, things get a little bit more challenging because nobody owns the commons personally. Well, I agree that, you know, making uh, the use of energy a, a personal, a personalized thing, and it's something you're personally responsible for, I think, has been shown to be, particularly with an energy dashboard in your house, is a pretty powerful way of doing that. But mm -hmm. in a larger sense, it is a little bit more of a tricky thing. You know, convenience is always, you know, a big factor in our adopting um, new technologies or products. Um, but I, I find one of the challenges is also just getting the infrastructure in place. I mean, for example, connecting your wing to the, uh, a smart power grid, I mean, that, which isn't really necessarily in place. And we heard this morning about GE coming out with a new um, charger for electric cars. And you know, that's one of the big fears is, is um, uh, people, and I think uh, people's reluctance to adopt a, um, the electric cars because it's range fear that they're gonna drive, they're gonna run out of the electricity and be stranded. So we need to get the infrastructure in place for the cars to, for people to start um, um, adopting or purchasing, the, buying into the electric cars. Um, we, have a, we have a question now from uh, a Twitter question. 
What about energy in the shipping business? Five million containers transport the goods worldwide. Huge, huge area that most of us don't see the sh cargo ships. And so again, speaking about a, a lack of awareness. Um, we'd be happy to tow container ships with kites. <laughs> is that a viable solution? It actually is a viable solution. There's a German company that's doing it at the moment. Um, they, uh, you know, the trouble with the shipping industry is they're not at the moment energy constrained, they're more time constrained. Mm -hmm. So it's very tough to sell um, uh, a, a wind-based solution at the moment, but I think that time is, is coming soon because there is, that is one of the industries where you uh, cannot, you need some sort of transportable fuel in order to actually get across the ocean very simply. Um, whereas in some other cases, there's some ways you can get around it. Great question. We have a, we have a prototype ship in the, the triennial dealing with some of these issues, so. Mm -hmm. hey, I don't, it's amazing when you, you know, when we purchase things online, as we all do, you don't really get a sense. Again, I think there's something that could be done in e-commerce systems where you can um, be encouraged to, you know, there, there are all these sort of aggregate um, commerce sites. You should be encouraged to purchase goods that are a little closer and, and that could be measured, that could be part of um, a new, you know, online e-commerce system. Why not? That's easy. Sure. Let's do that. Corin, I, I, um, and actually this is a question for all of you. Um, what research or for further studies would you like to see in the area of energy efficiency or sustainability? I know you've been working in a lot of areas of renewable energy. Uh, well, yes, we are focused on renewable energy, and uh, while um, personally I think all of us on the team are very sensitive to efficiency and so forth, at least in Makani, the, um, you know, that is, that is not our, technically our focus. Um, as far as more studies that could be done, I, certainly the one I mentioned earlier I think is one that's very important because I think that um, a lot of the passive things about the way we live uh, or more or less passive solutions to the way we use energy um, are not, are sort of underexploited at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that can be. Such as? So such as, uh, you know, solar thermal design in people's houses, I think is a very important one. Um, I might uh, throw out riding your bike to work, which is um, something we all practice, at least at Makani. Um, and I, you know, again, it, uh, maybe going back to the visualization of energy, if you do some pretty quick calculations on how much energy you're either making or displacing by riding your bike, it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. You know, it's, uh, humans are good for about uh, 200 watts when you're riding your bike. And you think about how easily you just flip a switch and use 200 watts, whether it's two light bulbs, and how much work that actually physically takes. That's one way of visualizing energy um, in a very sort of um, visceral way. I'd like to see more research uh, into the, uh, the, the complete translation of the design process um, into carbon, a carbon accounting system that can be used during the design process to inform decisions. Uh, right now, uh, speaking of visualization problems, we don't as a culture understand carbon as a currency. Mm -hmm. We I don't. Exactly it, it, yeah. I mean, we just don't understand. We understand what a dollar is, but we don't understand what a ton of carbon is. So, yeah. creating an understanding of that as a currency, providing interactive tools so that as you're making decisions about design um, on a daily or hourly or a minute by minute basis, there is knowledge about the currency of the carbon you're expending. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I was gonna say the same thing. I can't really feel it. Richard's example of the, the whale and the tongue the size of the bus. I feel like I, I, these units that we've been using to measure like, you know, the carbon footprint, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I also don't really understand how um, energy works, how, what happens with the power company and the grid. And I know that GE um, has some work in that area, um, I mean, t to visualize and understand the smart grid. I just, I, I can't connect with it yet. That's, that's what I would like to see done, and I'd love to do that, too. I mean, I guess to add to that, as far as the smart grid goes, it's um, having a larger grid and a more intelligent grid is, is the key to enabling large 
deployment of renewable energy. It's, you know, we do in this country, well, in the world, unfortunately, the quality of renewable energy is not uniform across the globe. And so you have places with very good resource and places with fairly poor resource. And if you want to make a large uh, impact in our usage of energy, in other words, you know, so here in this country, we're using about one and a half terawatt of, of electricity all the time, more or less. And you could generate that from wind. You could probably generate that with solar. Um, but in order to be able to do that, you need to somehow connect with a very high quality grid all the different parts of the country so that the places that are actually generating it can be connected to the places where the usage is high. Um, I know we just have a couple um, minutes left, but I'm just wondering um, if any of you, if you, if I could ask you to do some intelligent forecasting, um, in what ways do you think buildings in American cities are going to look different than they do now? I'll start this. <laughs> um, you know, I think the question of the relationship between aesthetics and performance is a huge one. And uh, in many regards, I think it's the paradigm shifter that architecture has been um, in the throes of for uh, the last decade or more. And we don't yet know a tremendous amount about it but it will and already is having a huge impact on uh, the form and appearance of our buildings, and um, it's going to continue to do so. I think we're gonna see a lot more buildings that are more fully operable, uh, and that may be the most fundamental change in the appearance of our buildings. For the most part, in temperate climates, buildings are designed for averages, um, for average conditions of heat and cold and wind and rain during the course of a year. And there's a certain percentage of a building that's a window and a certain percentage that's a wall. And if you look at vernacular design throughout the world, you'll see those percentages and they're um, designed for those average conditions. Uh, the problem with averages, of course, is they, they almost never exist or they might exist for the, a total of one day of a year precisely which means you're not optimizing um, your performance very well if you basically are functioning on an average. Uh, so if you can develop structures and buildings that uh, are adjustable, that are more like a sailboat responding to circumstances of wind. Um, I say a kite, but. Um... Yeah, or a kite, <laughs> um, but that, that are fully adjustable, that can be completely opened when the weather would allow it on the one hand, and completely and very robustly sealed on the other hand, uh, you can vastly change the energy performance of a building, almost eliminating um, a lot of the, of the necessity, for instance, for air conditioning in certain circumstances. So uh, that's something I think that'll really change the face of our buildings and cities over time. Instead of looking out um, behind us here into buildings that are punched holes in the wall, um, and only a tiny fraction of that window, less than half of them, um, can open. You see far more operability of, of buildings. Great. Well, it's time to wrap it up, but I look forward to future designs consolidating all of your areas of expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you.